welcome to my study and to the short presentation on how to win a war or what winning in war actually means. Now you might say that this is a bit of a silly question at first glance because it is pretty obvious what winning a war means, isn't it? You normally declare war, you go to war, you find battles and campaigns and based on the outcome of these you then come to some sort of political arrangement. And yet once you start scratching the surface, you see that the whole concept is far more complex and far more complicated and confusing, actually, than it appears at first glance. You might perhaps say that the whole concept is not merely political or based in the military world, but it has a philosophical aspect to it. And of course, the moment you mention war and philosophy together in one sentence, there's one thing you can't avoid, and that is talking about Karl von Clausewitz. I can already feel your despair while you're watching the screen now, but don't worry. I'm not going to be talking too much about Clausewitz. I'm not going to present all of his findings and his ideas, because that would be uh, far too complex for a short presentation like this. But, we, but we'll use Clausewitz's ideas as a, as a starting point to think about winning a war and winning a war in its totality, so rather than mere military victory on the battlefield. So when we look at Clausewitz and his definition of war, what does he actually say? He says, war is an act of force to impose the will on the enemy. And we can take away a few things from that. The first thing is, that is an act of force. If no force is involved, there is not a war. So he's actually quite clear cut on this. Um, there's not a lot of room for gray area activities or something like this. A war is a war because you have an act of force. So for example, imposing sanctions on, on a regime that you don't like would not be considered uh, an act of war by Clausewitz. But of course, the important thing is that you impose your will. And again, you can see that this takes us away from the, the mere battlefield and the fighting on the battle, and that it reaches a higher dimension, which is normally linked to the political sphere. And we'll return to that in a minute. And how do you fight a war? Again, I'm not going to be talking about all the different concepts and ideas in, and ideas in, in all their depths because it would simply take too long. But according to Clausewitz, we have two different ways of doing this. So the first one is the limited war with the limited war aims. And then we have what Clausewitz calls the absolute war, which is very often translated in English as total war. And this is actually um, a good point to, to think a little bit about Clausewitz and his writing. If you're able to, I would always urge you to read Clausewitz in the original German. I know it's a bit of a schlep, it's hard going. Uh, Clausewitz stands in the typical Germanic tradition of writing very, very long and complicated sentences. So yes, you always be looking for the verb at the end of the sentence. But if you don't read the original, um, it, it's very difficult to really get to the bottom of Clausewitz and his thinking. So let's just use as a quick example this term absolute war that, uh, that Clausewitz talks about. This term is uh, normally translated in the English language as total war. And this is a slightly misleading because the moment we say total war, we've got all sorts of pictures in our heads about nuclear war and total war in the 20th century, i.e. Uh, complete uh, nu nu uh, nuclear destruction. This is not, of course, what Clausewitz talked about because these weapons simply hadn't been invented. And while quite often in discussions you can see that people now say that the idea of total war is an abstract idea that cannot be reached, Clausewitz actually is quite, quite clear in saying that absolute war, absoluter Krieg, as he called it in German, is something that he saw in his lifetime. Of course, he, saw, he said that uh, during the times of the uh, Napoleonic Wars, this is exactly what he saw. So terminology is really, really important here, and we need to keep a close eye eye on that. Um, another point that uh, Clausewitz uh, makes, and you're probably familiar with if you've ever looked at Clausewitz uh, at all, is uh, his idea of the chameleon. He says that war is a chameleon, so it changes the character, but uh, the nature uh, of war endures. And then also when we link this to uh, to uh, our question of um, what is winning in war and how to win a war, this also applies here. So just to give you one example, take the Second World War and look at the outbreak of the war. So Germany invades Poland in 1939. As a consequence, of course, Britain and France declare war on Germany. So if you now fast forward a few years and look at how the situation has changed by late 1944. So the Germans have now been driven out of Poland again and are standing on the borders of the Reich fighting against the Soviet army. 
if you now take the original war aims and the original idea of what winning was for the British, uh, as declared in the declaration of war, i.e. Uh, the liberation of Poland, independence of Poland and end of Nazi aggression, wouldn't it make sense for a British politician to now make peace with Germany and perhaps declare war on the Soviet Union? because people knew in those days that uh, the, uh, the independent freedom of Poland would not really be guaranteed by the Soviet Union. Of course, that was no longer uh, an option because the war aims had changed. But if you just think about it for a moment, it's an interesting little, little conundrum and, and one that really shows the, the changing character, not only of war itself, but also of the definition and the pursuing of war aims. And uh, by that, I mean, and how to win a war. Probably one of the uh, most often used examples and quotes from Clausewitz is, um, is about the, uh, the trinity of war. And this again is, is very confusing um, and uh, it needs an awful lot of study to really get to uh, the bottom of it. I'm just going to read to you, so I get it absolutely right, the translation of uh, the first trinity that, uh, that Clausewitz mentioned. And uh, it reads as, uh, the Trinity is composed of primordial violence, hatred and enmity, which are to be regarded as a blind natural force of the play of chance and probability within which the creative spirit is free to roam, and of its element of subordination as an instrument of policy which makes it subject to reason alone. Again, using the German translation or the German original um, would be better, but uh, let, let's stick with the, uh, the English translation uh, for, this, for this short presentation. So basically, and you might be familiar with this if you ever have dealt with Clausewitz, so you have three different parts that, um, that show their face in war. And that's first of all, it's reason, then it's chance, and then it's violence. And then in itself is fine, but it's also quite confusing because what does it actually mean? And in order to explain that, we then use the, the second Clausewitz in Trinity in which he links that to to certain areas of the um, of the state, and Clausewitz argues that uh, the area of reason, that is uh, is politics and the government, because their decisions should be at least in theory made on uh, on reason. We then have uh, the area of chance, which uh, relates to uh, the military, because military action cannot fully be um, uh, planned in advance. This is one of his his great points about his philosophy that uh, there's always this element of chance in war. Uh, even on the battlefield and because of the uh, consequences of battlefield action, also for the further consequences, i.e. for example, can you win this war? How will you win this war? If you're going for total destruction of the enemy, uh, if you want world domination, um, but then you can't achieve that, how are you going to deal with this? So if you're, for example, uh, Hitler sitting in the bunker in April 1945 and you're still planning for world domination, that perhaps is not a particular good use of strategy and Clausewitzian thinking. And the last point uh, relates to violence, and, uh, and that is in Clausewitz's understanding, well, that is the people. And this, this um, factor of the people, of course, is what he sees as the big game changer, because he saw uh, the, the importance of, of violence and the importance of the people's will during the time of the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars, the period that he fought in, uh, which basically triggered his, um, his idea to write this as well as a philosophical work on uh, um, on war and, uh, and how to fight and how to win a war. Um, it also, of course, the, the last very famous quote that probably everyone knows, uh, which is very often misquoted, uh, used uh, uh, constantly in, uh, in essays and writings, what have you, without a lot of deeper thinking going into it, is of course that war is the continuation of politics by other means. Again, when we look at the original, the wording is slightly different. Um, you also have the underlying issue that you might be familiar with, that the, the German word politik uh, basically means policy, politics and polity. So it's a bit, uh, it's a bit more, well, for a better, perhaps you might say, if you want to put that term in a bit more wishy-washy than the, uh, the English translation, but it's also more all-encompassing. So um, again, that causes some sort of um, problems. But let's, let's stick with politics at the moment, because this is uh, the translation that is, is normally used. So if war is the combination of politics, does that mean that 
the mm, politics part in the Trinity, where you have the reason, i.e. politics, i.e. reason, i.e. government, is the most important one. And then that, for that reason, it should always take precedence. Well, this is very much, you might say, the, the accepted view now in the West. You just need to look at the, uh, the structures of states, um, uh, the control of armies, and all these things. However, and here I'm very much following Professor Sir, uh, Sir Hugh Strawn's argument, we have to understand that when Clausewitz writes about this, he talks about a trinity. And of course, there are some religious connotations here. We mustn't forget that Clausewitz uh, was, um, was a good Protestant, a Lutheran, and actually his great-grandfather had been a Lutheran priest. His uh, uh, grandfather was uh, a professor of theology, so he had a very deep understanding of religion, what religion means, and also, of course, the terminology. So when he talks about a, uh, a trilogy, for Clausewitz, all these three parts are of equal importance. So when you look at, um, when you look at the conduct of war and how to win a war, you might actually have to say that all three of these are of equal importance. And that means if you want to win a war, you also have to, uh, you have to deal with all these, threes, uh, all these three and uh, have to put the same uh, uh, um, importance, and attach the same importance to them. It also does not necessarily mean that you have one particular center of gravity that you can attack, um, center of gravity that you take out that makes you win the war. Um, there might be different ones. It might be just one of the, one of the three. It might be all three. Uh, and that, again, adds a level of complexity that uh, we sometimes don't really see when we concentrate too much on the political level. And when we concentrate on the military as the long arm of, of, of politics. So for example, if you look at this, quite clearly you can see that already we're beginning to write out the fundamental finding of Clausewitz, and that's the idea of violence and the, the important role that the population, in whatever shape or form, plays in war itself. So we might want to think a little bit about that. It also means that when you have these, these three areas, and they're of equal importance, it might mean that perhaps when it comes to winning a war, they don't always match. You might, for example, say that you might win a war politically. And that's what happens most of the time because you sign a peace treaty, so you've lost the war. But it does not necessarily mean that this applies to the other two parts of the Trinity. To give you one example, and here I'm uh, following an argument uh, developed by Professor Hubert from Vienna University. When you look at Germany at the end of the First World War, and you compare the situation in Germany uh, to the Trinity, and the three points of the Trinity. Of course, Germany had been defeated militarily. There's absolutely no question about that. Um, of course, the population was suffering. So you have uh, the war dead, you have um, after the war, uh, inflation, economic crisis, all these things. So these two parts of the, of, the pop, um, of the Trinity were obviously deeply affected. You could, however, if you wanted to make the argument that Germany from a strategic point of view, so if you go to the to area of reason and so broadly defined uh, um, as government and, and political interaction, that Germany actually was not a loser of the First World War. Because what happens in the international stage is that the map of Europe changes. Yes, Germany loses some territory. Germany has been defeated militarily. The population is suffering. But from a pure um, power political point of view, you might actually say that the German position, particularly in the medium and long run, um, was, was strengthened. Because the big fear of Germany had always been that it had been uh, sandwiched between France on the one hand and Russia on the other. And this is, of course, one of the reasons uh, which leads to the, uh, the outbreak of, of the First World War. In 1918-1919, this situation completely changed and disappears because the Soviet Union is now the pariah. Um, the Western countries will not, talk to, uh, will not really talk to the Soviet Union. And Germany can, as they then would in later years of the Weimar Republic and even in, uh, the, uh, during the early years of the Third Reich, can establish a rather useful strategic alliance with the Soviet Union. They'd also be able, um, as they did, to play Poland off against Russia or the Soviet Union if they, if they seem fit. And that worked quite well for Germany up to, you might say, the outbreak of, um, of the Second World War. So again, there are some points here that, that need to be considered. It's not all only about the political level. And if you use another example, if you concentrate on the political level, you might actually say, if you look just at it very, very from a pure legal point of view, 
that Germany didn't, didn't lose the Second World War. Because what happens in, in May 1945 is that Germany, uh, of course, surrenders on the 8th of May to the Allies and uh, surrenders uh, basically on, on military terms. So military action comes to an end. The German government, uh, sitting up in Flensburg in northern Germany, remains in power for a few more months. And there is no peace treaty signed because there wasn't, there wasn't uh, the need to sign one um, as seen by, by the Allies because Germany had been completely and utterly defeated. And so Germany didn't really have to sign a peace treaty. And actually, up to this day, there is not a peace treaty between Germany and uh, the Allied powers of the Second World War. What has been used as some sort of de facto peace treaty quite often or seen as it, um, are the so-called uh, so two plus four treaties um, in 1990, which led to the unification or reunification of Germany. So you've got two, that's the two German states, plus four, that's the four allied powers of 1945. And it's only at that particular time in 1990 that Germany actually gets full sovereignty uh, back from the allies. Up to 1990, they did not really have that. They had most of their sovereignty, but there were certain areas where the allies still had a say, for example, the status of the city of Berlin. So if you just apply this, uh, this model that you always have to have a political solution, you always have uh, the precedence of politics. Well, actually, you might say World War II never came to an end. And there is a small group of people in uh, particular in Germany who actually argue this, and so who because of this, and because there is no peace treaty, they argue that the German Reich, the, uh, the German Empire, never stopped existing, which is a rather interesting thought. It also means that um, when you start looking at these three levels, and from that you start developing your centers of gravity that you want to hit and you want to, to seize or defeat, in order to, to not only achieve victory on the battlefield, but overall um, winning in a war, you need to make sure that you choose the right one. And we all know how very difficult that is. It's difficult at the tactical level, it's difficult at the operational level, and perhaps it's the most difficult and most confusing at the, uh, the strategic level, uh, because you've got all these different factors then playing together. And this is, of course, exactly what, uh, what Clausewitz is, is looking at and uh, what he was aiming for, so discussion of these very, complex and, uh, and very confusing issues. So I'm just going to give you a number of examples where people have chosen the wrong centers of gravity. Um, take Germany in World War II, um, in particular the war you might perhaps say in the East. So the German army wins battle after battle, campaign after campaign, particularly in the early phase, um, but they still lose the war because they simply had got their centers of gravity wrong. Not only at the tactical and operation level, but embedded in, in the strategic um, uh, scene as well in the wider setting. You go back into antiquity, you've got uh, an, an interesting uh, example as well. So after the Battle of Cannae, in which Hannibal defeated the largest Roman army ever put into the field, the gates to Rome practically stood open. And uh, Hannibal sits on the, uh, on the battlefield and, and ponders and thinks about what to do next. And he decides that he will not go for Rome. He will not besiege the city. He will not attack the city. And probably he had good uh, political and in particular also military reasons for that. But at that particular point, he's challenged by one of his generals who says, Hannibal, you know how to win a battle, but not how to use this to win a war. So again, you can see the, the pure um, concentration on uh, military affairs and military matters is not really enough to win a war. And you can bring it forward as well if you look at, for example, um, Vietnam and Afghanistan. Here you have two examples where the will of the people is probably the most important factor. The Americans won battle after battle in, in Vietnam. Uh, the Western forces uh, won uh, engagement after engagement uh, in Afghanistan. And yet, uh, Vietnam was lost and in Afghanistan we're currently in peace negotiations. Why is that? Because these were unpopular wars and the will of the population was not really behind that. And if you choose the enemy's target wisely and you know that this is one of the, uh, the weak spots, you can actually do that. So from a pure military point of view, if you have lots of body bags being sent home, you know that this will have a bad impact on the population, particularly if you have free press. If the war is already unpopular, in particular because it's a war of choice and not for national survival. This will make the war even more unpopular and will have an impact on how you can actually fight the war. So how do you actually overcome all these problems and issues um, and trying to, to bring together all these parts of a trinity 
uh, so that you can that you can actually win a war, not just battles and campaigns, but actually a war. Well, for Clausewitz, the answer, one of the answers, again, it's, it's very complex and very detailed, and we're only scratching the surface here. One of the answers uh, is that you should try to combine uh, the political and military leadership in one hand. And he uses a number of historical examples. And of course, Napoleon is one. And uh, the, other, the other great example for him is Frederick the Great, who had shown in the, in the wars of the 18th century, between 1740 and the 1760s, that this combination um, of military and um, political power in one hand was extremely useful because um, Frederick the Great had been constantly able to outmaneuver his opponents, in particular the Austrians, where the, uh, the military leaders would always have to go back to the court in Vienna, and of course in those days that took time, to get decisions made on, on military outcomes. So the idea of the, the so-called work on the table, so the, uh, the military uh, and political leader in one hand is uh, an extremely powerful one to, to Clausewitz. Clausewitz also says if that cannot be achieved, what you should have is you should have a trusted advisor, military advisor, who then uh, advises the king. And of course, in those days, we need to think that Sir Clausewitz is not thinking about um, Western-style democracy as we see it today, but of course, he'd still have the king at the top. But uh, uh, the idea is that you have a trusted advisor who really has the ear of the, uh, the political leader and that stage the king. Otherwise, he says, you're immediately running into, into problems. And that can be extremely powerful. Um, the combination of two, um, it can also lead to, to some other issues and problems. And when you go back into antiquity, if you look at some of these wars there, you could actually say that relatively often, not always, but relatively often, a battle actually did decide the outcome of the war, something that is rather unthinkable of, um, of today. And why was that? Well, mainly because if you combine the political and the military leadership in, in one hand, and don't forget, now this is not the time of the nation state, so that the people actually do not really play such a role. So you've got the king on the battlefield, and for example, this king gets killed. You immediately have taken out not only the military leadership, but also the political leadership. A good example of this, of course, would be the Battle of Hastings, when Harold gets killed by the, uh, the arrow that flies into his eye. Well, practically the battle, and with us also the war is over, even though, of course, well, there were more skirmishes and it took some time to actually conquer the uh, 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 British Isles completely. Uh, the Normans had some problems, but that these are... Um, um, subsequent matters. And of course, as I've already said, you, perhaps you might actually say this, this made warfare a little bit easier and perhaps also a bit less confusing. But these are not the times we live in today. And when we look at, um, at winning a war, we need to understand and we need to accept that uh, we have to face uh, far greater complexities. Again, linked to the three components, not just to the three components of the, um, of the Trinities. And that, of course, is, um, as I've already said, this is the big realization of Clausewitz. So it's the impact of societies, the impact of people on um, the war efforts, on the conduct of war, um, and uh, including that, and also, of course, how to win a war. And the, the big game, game changer, of course, for um, Clausewitz was the, uh, the, uh, the French Revolution where for the very first time in, in modern history, he saw that the, uh, the people, the population, actually started playing a role in the state's affairs. I don't want to go into a whole discussion of uh, uh, the structure of states and, uh, and, and, and democracy, because that would just uh, leave us, uh, lead us too far. So let's use a bit of a broad brush and, uh, brush and uh, a slightly crude argument and saying that with the arrival of the French Revolution, uh, the people suddenly had uh, say in their state's affairs. And you can actually even see that uh, summed up very nicely in the French national anthem. Allons enfants de la patrie. So let's go children of the fatherland. Um, this whole idea of fatherland um, was something that up to that point um, had probably not really been raised. And uh, when you then look at the reactions of other countries where you also have the rise of nationalism after the arrival of, uh, of Napoleon and the Napoleonic Wars. Well, first of all, it needs to see that, um, um, for example, being German meant I'm not French. So again, you can see there's an interaction between, uh, between these two. Um, and of course, it all, it all links to the arrival of the nation state. And the, uh, the modern definition of a nation state includes the fact that you need to have a certain group or a set uh, of people living within a certain set of boundaries. And also the state should have the monopoly of force. So again, you begin to see that there are some links there to the uh, Clausewitzian thinking and the Clausewitzian trinity. And when you look at the history of warfare after 1870, 
uh, after uh, the French uh, Revolutionary Wars and, and Napoleon, you can actually see that you, you have a bit of a clash between different philosophies. Even the French um, wrote back after, um, after Napoleon and uh, they established a slightly more mixed system. Um, and it's not really the, the embodiment of a pure nation state anymore. However, they still had it. And based on that, even Napoleon could then call, and even before that, they could call for what they called the levée en masse. So basically, um, uh, some sort of a form of national service, because the argument was, this is your country, you, you fight for it. And this system they, uh, they kept um, after Napoleon had, had gone, they bring in uh, uh, the monarchy. Again, I'm not going to go into any, any great uh, uh, detail here. But what we then have is um, the uh, Franco-German War of 1870-71, often called in British or in English, uh, the, uh, the Franco-Prussian War, which is slightly incorrect, so let's go with Franco-German War. And this war really is interesting because as the war goes on, you can see this, this change and you move from what you might say two points of the Trinity that you, need to, uh, that you need to keep in mind if you want to really win a war, not only a battle, but you want to win a war. And suddenly we have the third pillar, the people and the violence brought back in. Because what happens is then the first phase of the war in 1870, it is actually, it is actually what you might call still a bit of a cabinet war. Um, so it has some features of, of previous times. So it's basically um, a war by the, the ruling houses. So the French emperor, the Prussian king and, and other kings. Yes, armies are based on conscription because you already have an idea of, of a bit of a nation state and people wanting to defend their country. But it is very much, when you look at, when you look at the, the general structure, the general idea, also a war of the, the established elite, for a better term. What then happens in, in the first phase is that the, the German troops, and again, I'm not going to give you any great detail, that will be another lecture, they managed to, um, to defeat the French forces. They capture the, uh, the French emperor, uh, who then, uh, after a short period, actually emigrates to, uh, to Britain, and he's buried in Farnborough, of all places. Um, and the Germans actually think now the war is over, because we have defeated these two pillars. We've taken out the political government, uh, the um, uh, the king has gone, the emperor has gone, we've defeated the army, so basically for us the war is over. But what happens now is that you have an uprising in first in Paris and then all over France, and the French actually continue to fight. And this really, to begin with, confuses the Germans, because we thought the war was over, we thought we had won the war, not only won the battles and achieved military victory, but won the war. And they come under some, some real severe pressure having to fight with the, uh, the nation's warner that they're facing in France itself. In the end, they win. As a consequence of that, they also form the, uh, the German Empire in January 1817. But it's, it's, this is a lesson that the Germans didn't forget. And it's really interesting that when you look at um, the German chief of the general staff, the most famous one, Helmut von Moltke, who was the big, um, the big, uh, the big winner of the, uh, the, the German Wars of Unification. So he was actually the, the planner of the War of 1864, where you have, uh, again, I'm keeping it very simple, um, uh, uh, the German Federation fighting against Denmark. Then you have the, uh, the, the again, very simple, the Prussian-Austrian uh, War of 1866, and then the German-French War of 1870. So he was the chief of the, uh, the German staff of the Prussian army, and he's the big, uh, the big victor of these battles. And because it is Germany and because it's Prussia, he as a field marshal uh, is entitled to give speeches in Parliament. And in his very last speech that he gives in Parliament before he retires, so that's well before the outbreak of the First War, of course, he says that the lesson of the last war needs to be that Germany must not be going to war again, because the days of the cabinet wars are over. You cannot win a war by fighting a cabinet war. The next time Europe goes to war, he says, it will be a 30 years war. And uh, he who um, basically starts this war should be done because it will lead to the complete destruction of the European state and the European nation. So there was a very clear understanding, again, that in order to win the war, you need to, if unleashed, and if absolute war is unleashed, you need to address all three um, uh, pillars of the Clausewitz in Trinity. Very different if you fight a limited war, where you can also make choices. Do I want to send another division? Do I want to send another corps? Do I want to invade this particular country? But of course, this also links back to the question of or the point of the war being a chameleon. When you start a war, you don't know what the situation will be like at the end. So war is a very complex uh, issue and that of course also includes winning a war and actually making making a peace. So what does that actually mean? 
So if we want to win a war, how are we going to go about it? Well, first of all, again, to go back to the introduction, we need to understand that in Clausewitzian terms, in Clausewitzian understanding, it is an act of force. Without force, there is no war. And I think it would be really useful if, um, in particular, political leaders would be a bit clearer in, uh, in the rhetoric that they sometimes use, because we, we talk of, to of wars in all sorts of different areas. We talk of a war and a fight against the coronavirus. Um, it also then boils, uh, comes down to points of strategy. What is the strategy? And even this term is being used completely incorrectly if you link it to Clausewitz understanding and to military terminology. So that, that confuses matters. And it makes the, um, uh, the conversation between the military and the political leaders uh, more difficult than it really needs to be. We also need to understand and to analyze our enemy's center of gravity within these three pillars. So is it enough? to simply attack the people's opinion back home. Is that not enough? Will that turn the tide back in the, uh, in, in the enemy nation and so they will make some sort of peace? Do we need to crush the enemy's uh, military? Do we need to take out the, um, the political leadership? Do we really need to occupy and conquer all the, uh, uh, the enemy territory in order to basically hammer it home to the enemy that they've lost and we have won? So these are questions that need to be discussed. And also, of course, as I said now a number of times, we need to be aware that these aims do change. They change in our camp and they can change in the other camp. They can change because of all the three pillars that we have. They can change because of political decisions, they can change because of military reality and because of the, let's call it the mood of the population. And not only, of course, do we need to understand the enemy's trinity and within that the enemy's center of gravity, but we also, and that is perhaps the very first point that we need to address, we also need to understand our own. And if we don't understand our own, um, we become vulnerable and it will be easier for the enemy to win. Uh, even if we manage to defeat the enemy and aim for a, uh, a longer lasting peace, uh, we are winning the actual war, not just the campaign. Um, if we choose the wrong um, center of gravity from our own um, uh, background, we might also end up disappointing, for example, the population because they don't get the war that they want, uh, the, the result that they want. Um, the character changes, I've now said a number of times, and that I, I keep repeating this because that's really quite important. Um, so the war that you start is not going to be the war that you finish. And that also means that probably the war aims that you start with are not going to be the war aims that you finish with. So when it comes to winning a war, it is a rather dynamic process and you have to accept the realities of, um, of all three trinities um, and adapt uh, uh, your, um, uh, your, your principles or your ideas of winning that, that you can achieve. If you don't do that, you're probably most likely to fail unless your idea really is a complete destruction and annihilation in absolute and absolute krieg, absolute war that, uh, that Clausewitz talks about. But of course, this is a war that uh, we try to, if we can, to, uh, to avoid. And perhaps the last point of this uh, rather short lecture in which we're only just beginning to, to scratch uh, uh, the surface on, on a number of points, is of course that we need to realize that winning a war is not a finite process. You don't win a war and then that's it. Um, international relations, history, and all these things are processes. And winning a war is just one of the cornerstones within that. So the moment you have won, the moment you've got that particular type of peace that you want, you already have to start thinking ahead. You can't just stop there. Um, one good example of this um, is perhaps the, uh, the overall British strategy in the Second World War. The British, and one of the reasons why the British tend to win wars is because their strategies are very good. Um, when you look at, uh, for example, 1944, 1945, even at that point, uh, the British political and military leadership is beginning uh, to think about how to preserve manpower because they understand that they need to have an army, a re relatively strong army, in order to remain a main player um, on the international chessboard after the Second World War. They only concentrated on winning the war. They might have done things completely differently, but they understand that this is not a final point. It's not the end, um, but it's only um, one step in the development um, of history, uh, of the development um, of international relations. And all these things together, if you, if you start thinking about them, I mean a number of things. First of all, if you think about them, you can actually uh, achieve um, 
not only victory on the battlefield, but you can win a war. Um, but these things are extremely complex. Um, there are a lot of moving parts. You can't really foresee all of these moving parts as you go into a war. And that, of course, means that, um, as we always see when you go to war, things change. You need to change your tactics, your operations, uh, coalition change, all these things. And as I've said, this also means that uh, the idea of winning that you have at the beginning might differ fundamentally from what you get at the end. And I leave you with this and with this thought. As I said, this was only to really scratch the surface, to, uh, to make you start thinking about some of these concepts behind it. And perhaps also, um, if, you, if you're really brave, uh, to encourage you to take up some Clausewitz, if that's what you really want to do. Thank you very much. Bye.